Well, first of all, um, thank you again for doing this. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And I thought it would be nice before we talk about the present to just kind of rehash the your history because it's been fun to to learn about it. I learned a lot during Blue Valentine, and I just think people should know the foundation upon which uh, Place Beyond the Pines is built. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about, you know, growing up, where where were you growing up and, and did you go, were the movies a big part of your life even as a kid? Yeah, I grew up in Lakewood, Colorado, um, and uh, I feel like I'm a member of the VHS generation. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I was, my brother's eighth birthday party, I was five years old, and he, we rented a VCR for the first time, brought a top-loading VCR into our house, and rented Creep Show and Airplane 2, and uh, watched those movies, and I just, it just was, I, I was just blown away. And uh, two months later, I turned six years old, and we rented uh, a top-loading VCR, and we rented two movies for a slumber party, Creep Show and Airplane 2. <laughs> and then uh, about five months later, we bought our own VCR, and uh, HBO was playing Creep Show and Airplane 2, and we recorded it, you know? Uh, we would record three movies a tape, right. and so uh, and by the time I was in fourth grade, I had seen Creep Show <laughs> and Airplane 2 200 times each because I would watch them. You know, that was which was better in oh, your Creep final Show. assessment? Creep Show, Show. George, <laughs> George Romero, yep. all the way. Um, <laughs> you know, I love George Romero, and that Creep Show I think is kind of a masterpiece. And uh, same with his, you know, Dawn of the Dead and, and uh, Night of the Living Dead. But mm -hmm. anyway, those, you know, I had my library was made out of. Uh, VHS tapes with three movies recorded on them. We had a nice little folder, a binder that my dad had made up with the counter, and you know, you you had to fast forward to seven six two eight, you know, uh, for uh, the Godfather yeah. to start, you know, and it's just my my whole life was spent doing that, watching, studying movies over and over again on VHS. When did the idea first sort of occur to you that you might actually be able to or want to make movies, be on the other side of the camera? I mean, I, I don't remember a time when I didn't want to do it. Uh, also, early on, I, I had uh, my uh, I had a tape recorder that I used to always record people with. Um, I used to, you know, get do little skits on it or record, uh, you know, interview people in my family, just talk to them, get their voices, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. try to get my grandma to speak Chinese or. I'd use it as a surveillance device, sometimes hide it in a piece of clothing and then get someone to say something to right. me and then use that blackmail them with it. So I was doing everything I'm basically doing now right. as a filmmaker, you know, on, on audio cassette. And also, when I was a kid, I had this, uh, I used to always, I was always, uh, I was always, I was always curious as well, like why when I went into... <laughs> Uh, like friends' houses, they would have these pictures on the wall of everyone in their family smiling. You know those family portraits right. of everyone right. smiling, because I, I was, I used to always wonder like they these this house everyone's not smiling right mm -hmm. now. Like there was like all these these tensions I would feel in these houses and these secrets I would feel inside these houses and this great level of intimacy and then they, there would be these pictures of people smiling on the walls <laughs> and. Uh, and so I was all my I was always trying to f take pictures of mm -hmm. uh, other things, you know, when I was a kid. And uh, on my first roll of film, there was a there was a picture of uh, that I, you know, that I, that I have of my brother in his underwear, in uh, cover, you know, just with tears streaming down his face, screaming at the top of his lungs, and my mom with rollers in her hair in her nightgown. Uh, uh, just like frozen in front of the camera, wondering why the, that uh, little four-year-old right. kid is taking a picture of that, you know? Um, so it seems like, you know, even from that point, certainly one of the things that's defining your movies is that it's it's not, you, you're not sort of necessarily interested in painting a pretty picture. It's reality in a way, you know, really yeah. truth, and it seems like that's always been the interest then. Yeah, and in truth, it's... Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, in truth, there's... Uh, great humor you know truth is hilarious and uh and tragic you know and uh beautiful and ugly and yeah i'm interested in the uh battling dualities of life you know and and interested in family uh, uh you know making movies to you know because families have that intimacy and those secrets i think i like movies that have 
I like sitting in a movie theater and watching secrets and, and intimate moments on screen, you know, at, um, you know, uh, yeah, and, you know, all of the movies that when I finally started shooting on video when I was in, in high school, you know, I, I would just always use my family as, as my actors, you know, and just do things in my house, uh, you know. So, yeah, family and homes and home movies, that was just huge, huge, huge part of my life, of my upbringing. And your family, was, were your, your parents were together? Did you have siblings or like, yeah. with norm, relatively, quote-unquote, normal? Yeah, no, yeah, normal childhood. My, yeah. yeah, my father and mother were together. They split up when I was, like, uh, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an older brother mm -hmm. uh, who's a math teacher, and I have a sister who's 10 years younger than me who works at an assisted living facility oh, wow. in wow. Colorado. Yeah. So how did... What was the what was the genesis of Brother Tide? Because here you end up as a result of that at Sundance and and very, you know, and that was the beginning of the next chapter almost at the same you know that you could see where the two that one ends and the next one begins. But yeah. what was Brother Tide? How did it come about? Brother Tide was, um, you know, I made I started making that when I was twenty. Uh, you know, I had been in film school for a couple of years. I was studying under Stan Brakhage and Phil Solomon. And I had this, my whole childhood and adolescence was like full of just studying narrative films. And I ended up going to this film school that was a, a, an avant-garde and I'd say formalist film school. Um, you know, the first movies I saw there were Moth Light by Brakhage. You know, movies that were dealing with the plasticity and uh, the plasticity of the medium and... I just, uh, it opened my eyes to a whole new way of thinking about movies and structure. And, and uh, you know, I'd had some success with my early student films in college. And I think it, I think it was because I trained myself my whole, you know, adolescence leading up to that. I trained myself in understanding the grammar of mm -hmm. movie making. And, uh, you know, by the time I was in college, I had made like 22 short films, you know. Wow. That, you know, that just, you know, every three months I'd do a film. Um, you know they're ridiculous, but uh, but at least they they were. I was understanding of what a yeah. cut did and what a close up did and stuff like that. So I made so I dropped out of film school when I was twenty. I raised forty thousand uh, dollars from my dentist. You know I sold chocolate bunnies door to door and fertilizer and p potted plants and t shirts and did whatever I could do with a great team of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, with all my friends in film school, and we made we raised forty thousand dollars and shot this black and white film called Brother Tide. It was all about brotherhood. It was about a brotherhood of, uh, of, of friendship that was that kind of displaced this brotherhood of blood. And uh, uh, it was half of the movie we shot in slow motion. It was uh, a very formalist mm -hmm. exercise. It was. Um, I had a doo-wop Christmas soundtrack because I loved, uh, you know, I wrote the script uh, because my high school sweetheart had broken up with me on Christmas Eve and I spent all Christmas Eve listening to Elvis's Christmas album mm -hmm. and, uh, and the whole movie came to me in that night and, um, and the movie in a lot of ways is a, is a complete failure because it's content illuminating form mm -hmm. uh, it was, and the movie didn't have, it, it, you know, after I showed it at Sundance in 98, I didn't, no one wanted to talk to me about it, you know. There was not a distrib chance no distributor. No yeah. distributor, yeah, because I had these doo-wop Christmas songs we couldn't license. And so I kind of went to this, you know, I, I felt like I had to serve this cinematic penance, you know. And, uh, you know, immediately after, at Sundance in 98, I started writing Blue Valentine, you know, uh, with Joey Curtis, my, you know, kind of my co-conspirator mm -hmm. at the time. And we, uh, you know, wrote it and wrote it and wrote it and just, you know, we just kept getting rejected. Can I ask, where did the idea for that come from? For, Even Blue? Then for that one, yeah. Blue came from really because when I was a kid I had two nightmares, nuclear war or that my parents would get a divorce. And when I was 20 and just starting Brother Tide, uh, they split up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, uh, you know, kind of a, sh a shattering mm -hmm. experience in a lot of ways. And just all of my feelings from my childhood about that fear uh, I wanted to put into that movie. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it was, it felt like, again, I, w I had always been making movies about family. You know, mm -hmm. Brother Tad was about brothers, Blue Valentine's about yeah. husbands and wives, and even now The Place Beyond the Pines is fathers and sons, mm -hmm. and I think it's, uh, I'm just interested in that, yeah. that intimacy, you know. So, I guess the, the obvious question, which I know you've had to answer many times before, but yeah. 
from 1998 to 2010 is a is an unusually long period of gestation for a movie. Yeah. Um, what? Why did? You know, were, were, during those years, were you still working on it, or did you move on to other things and come back to it, or how were you even at that point sort of putting food on the table? Yeah, um, yeah. From '98 to 2010, I was like I said, I felt like I was serving the cinematic penance, mm-hmm. and uh, I was in movie purgatory, yeah. and I was having to uh, confess for my sins of my first feature, and uh, uh, I. I uh, you know, I wrote Blue Valentine, got rejected, wrote it again, got rejected, wrote it again, rejected got rejected. Rejected by studios. By studios, that, yeah. yeah, just just kept writing it, you know, kept getting rejected, kept then go back to it and write it. And then I moved to New York City in 1999 and, uh, uh, you know, just I collected unemployment checks and just kept writing Blue Valentine, tried to stay pure mm-hmm. as an artist. I was eating avocados, you know, that was it. Uh, you know, just storyboarding Blue Valentine, thinking nothing but Blue Valentine, mm-hmm. just trying to will it into life. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, and then, you know, I fell in love and uh, in 2001, mm-hmm. and we had a baby in 2004, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, we were buying diapers out of a change mm-hmm. jar, mm-hmm. a jar of change. And when that change jar got down to you know, just a few nickels and dimes and pennies, I realized that I should get to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I started directing documentaries and commercials. And uh, some people, you know, it's, you know, I was doing documentaries, sorry, I was doing documentaries for, uh, you know, for like MTV mm-hmm. or VH1. I was doing like documentaries on uh, basketball players, you know, and, and uh, you know, I did a documentary on Sean Combs and on Run DMC, and I worked with LeBron James wow. on this stuff. And uh, and uh, you know, I, I could always relate to those people and those stories because, like the basketball players, you know, these kids who grew up with the basketball. I was just to me, my camera was mm-hmm. my basketball. It was what I played with my whole life, and and so I was immediately like on the same page with them. And I and I started my ideas about. Uh, narrative started to and my ideas about how to make a film started to change and I started uh, I st- because in a documentary uh, when I'm when you're interviewing someone for instance they don't necessarily answer a question the way that you expect right, them right. to like right now I'm sure I'm going way too <laughs> no, that's winded good. on but you dance like, you dance around with them yeah, that's what yeah. you know but yeah you you have to you, you have to listen yeah. you really have to listen uh, and then when you're shooting, say, like a verite scene or something, mm-hmm. following somebody, you and something happens, mm-hmm. you can't repeat that ever again. You have to capture it once, mm-hmm. you know, and you have to train yourself and sharpen your your skills to be able to capture it. And so I started thinking a lot about, you know, I, and I was fascinated with that, you know, and and I started reimagining Blue Valentine in a way where I could make it feel even more real. Uh, and where I could actually have it be real and where I could set up situations where real life and fiction could collide, you know, and, you know, because I had always loved like Harmony Corinne's early films, you know, Gummo and Julian Donkey Boy and, you know, and Pasolini's movies, uh, you know, where, you know, it just felt like these, even when Pasolini did The Gospel According to St. Matthew, it was a biblical story with non-actors in black and white and mm-hmm. it just it felt so real to me but also so uh, spiritual you know it became something else when you mix those two mm-hmm. things together and uh, and you know eventually you know I, I had met Michelle Williams in 2003 you know for Blue and you know she was 21 years old at the time and uh, just off fresh off Dawson's Creek and no one would give me the money to make a movie with her you know how did you guys even find each other we had the same agency same agency okay. same, yeah Gersh we were yeah. at Gersh and uh, um, you know and it was a blessing because she was 21 yeah she couldn't make the movie yet she no, didn't know anything about yeah. having kids right. yeah you know and uh, you know, they met Ryan in 2005, and he thought he was too young to make the film. And Same way, like through the through the agency, or just like uh, I met fate. him. I met him because I had done a uh, Run DMC documentary for VH1, yeah. which was produced by Jamie Patrickoff, yeah. who yeah, yeah. was producing Half Nelson with yeah. Ryan, and he 
kept telling me you got to meet Ryan because you guys are like brothers, uh, you know, from another mother yeah. or whatever. And I think so, there's even a phys- in some ways a physical resemblance. Yeah, yeah, well, there used to be more of a physical resemblance, but now I'm losing my hair <laughs> and he's getting more muscles. Um, so we're going we're going further apart. Um, but anyway, when we met, we we felt like we should make movies together, and uh, we just waited for the right timing for Blue Valentine to work, and finally the opportunity came to make Blue Valentine work. But it was always teetering on the edge of never happening, you know, right up until the moment where, the, you know, at 2 a.m. one night, we were $75,000 short to make Blue Valentine. And by 8 a.m., the Bond company was coming in. And if we didn't find that $75,000, movie's done. That so that was, that was like two days of shooting, $75,000. Can't do that. Where does the money come from? I was making $75,000. It was my director's yeah, fee. Yeah. That's where it would come oh from. Gosh. I gave back my director's fee. Still had to pay taxes yeah, on it. Yeah. Um, but to me, it was because I had done those documentaries and I had done commercials mm-hmm. and not only trained myself uh, as a filmmaker, trained myself in a whole new way and mm-hmm. got so many thousands of hours experience directing and being on set and working with people. Not only did I have did I have that practice, but I also had bought... had saved money to buy my time back right you know and I could spend two years on Blue Valentine and not do anything else and finally have my purity as an artist Mm -hmm. you know not through being stubborn right but from sacrifice and and trying and I feel like after those 12 years I felt like I was a player sitting on the bench you know and uh you know if if a player sits on the bench they still have they have to practice all week Mm -hmm. you know I thought for a while I didn't have to practice I thought I was just (laughs) The coaches were stupid for not letting me in, you know, but then I realized I had to practice. And when I first started practicing, I was rusty, you know, I was no good. So I needed that practice. And so when I had my opportunity to go in the game, you know, I just, I really, I felt, I felt ready yeah. to do it, you know. And, and the, there were, I think, three people, at least three people without whom it wouldn't have worked, obviously yourself, but also you had to get the perfect, this movie's about two people for the most part and yeah. if you had gotten if one of them had been wrong it wouldn't have worked so yeah. I know that you know we talked at the you know a few years ago about just some of the things that you did to make it possible for you were so sure that you had the right people that you would do you would go to great great lengths to make it possible for them to whatever was necessary for them to be able to do it can you just you know for instance with with um, Michelle and, yeah. and relocating it and yeah. all that yeah I mean for you know Twelve years, Blue Valentine took place on the ocean side. Mm-hmm. It took, you know, I had spent so many years. Anytime I'd do a commercial or something, I'd go on a trip and I would travel all over the United States on the border of, you know, on the edge of the edge of the edge of our country to find the right beach to shoot Blue Valentine on. And I finally found it in Morro Bay mm-hmm. with this great smokestack right next to this giant rock, you know, and. Uh, and we were going to shoot in Morro Bay, and I finally got the money, you know. I had been set up with, uh, you know, in the past, with Bingham Ray had greenlit the film at United Artists, and then three weeks later, he got fired. And, uh, you know, all these things kept happening, you know, that stopped the movie. And so finally, I had the money. Ryan was free. I called up Michelle, and I said, Michelle, we're going, you know, like, uh, pack your bags. We're going to Morro Bay. Uh, we're going to make the movie. And she was very quiet on the other line and very disappointed. And she said, I'm, I can't make the movie because I made a promise to my daughter that, uh, you know, I would keep her in school and that I would tuck her in her bed every night. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with everything that had happened to them, you know, she felt like she needed to give her daughter stability. And, uh, and I was so disappointed and I hung up the phone and spent all night on the phone with producers talking about recasting and who we're going to get, who's available, and this and this and this. And I was just like, no, this is, it, it just all felt wrong, you know. So I called Michelle the next day and I said, uh, you know, the reason why you made that choice for your daughter mm-hmm. is the reason why you, no one else can be Cindy. Yeah. It's because of you as a human being that... Uh, uh, that, which was what always had made you the right person for this movie. So uh, I, if I can relocate the movie close to where you guys live, if I can make it an hour radius and promise you that you'll be there to 
tuck your daughter into bed every night and you can be there to take her to school every morning will you do the film mm -hmm. and she said oh that's the most generous thing that anyone's ever offered wow. me and and yes so I went on Google Maps and I typed in her address right. and then I looked at what was an hour away in Scranton right. <laughs> it was an hour away and so I got in, that day I got in my car and drove to Scranton and uh, with my production designer and it was that was it. It was amazing. It was exactly like Morro Bay. It just didn't have an ocean. Mm -hmm. but it didn't need an ocean. So I had to choose what I want heart and soul and human or an ocean. Right. You know, and I, I you know, I picked the, the, the person and I think that's you know, that's again what the, the you know, that was a huge lesson for me as a filmmaker. I wanted to make movies about people. Yeah. It wasn't about my preconceived notions or expectations of what something could be. It was about humans, people. Mm -hmm. And I think people are unpredictable mm -hmm. and so you know it led me in a whole direction of unpredictability mm -hmm. surprise mm -hmm. how do you and again documentary film mm -hmm. how do you handle it when you know when I went to Sean uh, Sean Combs mm -hmm. house and there was nothing on the wall behind him uh, you know where I was going to interview him and it was a white void mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't put anything on the wall to make it look better. I had to embrace the the wall, and it became it became what it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to you have to be able to embrace life right. as a filmmaker, or at least what I'm trying to do. No, I'm trying I, to I embrace think, life. But you know, one of the things that is so interesting about a sort of a common thread in a way between Blue Valentine and Place Beyond the Pines is that they're both told in an unconventional way. I mean, with Blue Valentine, we're jumping all over the place chronologically. And with Place Beyond the Pines, it's like three-act structure, literally, you know, where you have these, and, and, and you don't see that very often, where you'll sort of transfer to another completely different story and then a completely yeah. different period. And I just wonder, um, does that, does, are the roots of that in the, the sort of film school education that you were talking about earlier, is that something that you sort of continue on in, in your movies that way? Yeah. Um, yeah, that... Uh the linear structure of Pines w was always was always very integral to what the movie is about. It's a movie about lineage. Mm -hmm. It's a movie about legacy. That goes that legacy goes in forward motion. Um, uh, you know, pi pi the place beyond the Pines, the genesis for this movie and for the form and the structure and the story goes back twenty years. Um, in film school, I saw Napoleon, you know, for the first time, uh, Abel G Gantz, and I always wanted to make a triptych. I always dreamed of a triptych, making a triptych. So I had this idea of this formalist idea my, for 20 years, mm -hmm. thinking about what am I, what's the triptych movie? What's the tri <laughs> triptych? Holy Trinity, that's what I always call it, the Holy Trinity. What am I going to make? Um, and then, uh, you know, and then at the same time in film school, I saw Psycho for the first time when I was 19. Mm -hmm. And I'd always seen that shower scene right. in Psycho. And I'd all, uh, but I had no idea when I first saw the movie that I spent 45 minutes with Marion Crane right. before she eventually went to the shower. Right. Right. And when I saw it, I was just, I, was, I had my mind blown. So right. I had this structure. I had the form. I had the structure. And I needed a story to tell. Mm -hmm. I needed something to, to propel me into say into saying something. And uh, then in 2007, my uh, my wife was pregnant for the second time uh, with a boy, and uh, and I was reading a lot of Jack London books at the time, and because I was thinking a lot about legacy, and I was thinking a lot about becoming a father again, and thinking about what I was going to pass on to my children. Uh, you know, pass on to this new child, and I was thinking about this fire that I had always felt inside of me, um, and how it had helped me survive, and mm -hmm. how it had helped me do many things in my life, but how it had also destroyed many things mm -hmm. in my life, how it had been a painful thing. And I thought about how that fire was in my father, and how that fire was in my grandfather, and my great grandfather, and just thinking about how far back that fire went. And where it was started, you know, and I started thinking about choices and how anytime you make a choice, it it, there's a, it can reverberate and it can sometimes go throughout generations. And I was thinking about tribes and how people are born into certain tribes and you you have no choice, mm -hmm. you know, and you're born into a whole set of circumstances and. Uh, 
And then I was thinking about my baby who was unborn and I was thinking that this baby coming into the world and I was thinking about I just didn't want to soil him with my past experience. Mm -hmm. I wanted him to be clean. I wanted him to be fresh. I wanted him to have his own path. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, uh, you know, and it, all of a sudden the story became clear. I'd always, I, you know, I had that David Lynch book, Catching the Big Fish, you know, I'd, I'd always read that book too. Mm -hmm. You know, he, have you read that book? I haven't, but I know about it. I've heard yeah. about it, yeah. He talks about, you know, you have your fishing poles out, and sometimes you catch an, a little fish, and sometimes you catch a big fish. And on the place beyond the pines, yeah. I was thinking about all these things, and all this stuff in my head, and then all of a sudden I caught a big fish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, you know, I need to write with people. I could never write. I tried to write one script alone, this script called The Man with Purple Eyes, and uh, I spent about a year and a half on it. And I never got past page 10 because I kept going back and I went crazy. Uh, you know, I think this is the sign of, that's the sign of insanity because it's about repeating. Right. Never getting out of a cycle. I couldn't get that past page 10 on my own. But logistically, how do you write with multiple people? It seems like that would be, that would, I mean, I know it happens a lot, but how do you make it work? It's, it's a different kind of, very well, different kind of process. Well, it's because I'm, I'm not inherently a writer. I'm inherently a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. That's and filmmaking is a collaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, if I if I knew all the things, if I had all the right answers, we, we, okay. Uh, if I if I knew everything, if I had all the right answers, I would be a painter, right. or I would just be content. I could write a book, right. but I can't do that. I I like working with people. I like working with photographers, writers musicians, actors, and I like, uh, I like it when people squash their own egos and go for something greater than themselves. Mm -hmm. And to me, I'm like a coach. I feel like as a filmmaker, I'm a coach. Yeah. And I want to bring out the best in everyone. Uh, and so I met, uh, you know, to me, to write with someone else is, is just about having a conversation. It's about communicating ideas mm -hmm. and letting the best ideas Correct. rise, right. you know? So I met with... Uh, Ben Coccio, who had directed Zero Day at a at the Donut Pub in New York City, and he told me he was from Schenectady, which is where my wife was from. He told me his favorite movie of all time was Goodfellas, and that was my favorite movie of all time. And we uh, we just we had an immediate right. syntax, and uh, we start uh, and he just took this 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 these bones that I had, and he started making this soup with it, and. Uh, and uh, you know, I started working on it. You know, we we were working on it for many years, and this was 2007. I was I, I remember I was having dinner with Ryan Gosling one night, and uh, I was at his agent's house, and we were having duck confit, mm -hmm. and uh, he, uh, you know, we were talking about Blue Valentine, and we got to talking about other things, and Ryan started telling me this fantasy he always had about robbing banks, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> and that he always wanted to rob a right. bank, but that. He would never do it because he's scared of jail. Right. And I said, okay, well, if you've thought about it so much, how right. would you do it? Right. He said, well, I'd do it on a motorcycle because I'd wear a motorcycle helmet so right. I could disguise my identity. <laughs> and then I would ride away on a motorcycle and have a U-Haul truck parked right. four blocks away and pull into the back of the U-Haul truck and then drive away because people would be looking for a motorcycle, right. not a U-Haul right. truck. Right. And I said, well, that's crazy because <laughs> Ben and I have just written that into a script. <laughs> and it was... I was like, "Are you serious?" And he was like, "Yeah." And I was like, "He was like, are you serious?" And I was like, "Yeah." And it was one of those moments where we I, we knew we were born to yeah. make movies together. Mm -hmm. We were destined to make some mm -hmm. movies together, and and so you know the genesis started then, and then eventually you know just kept working on it, kept working on it, and then when Blue Valentine was finished in you know 2010, uh, you know opportunities came. You know, it's yes, like, yeah. what are you going to make next? And I had the script that I had been working on, and you know I was on the 24th draft, and. You know, and then I had another writer, a friend of mine, Darius Martyr, come in, and we just kept going at it, kept going at the movie, and uh, uh, just kept trying to find the truth, mm -hmm. find the truth in it, uh, trying to find something that was beautiful to us, something that talked about legacy, something that was clear, and, uh, you know, eventually the opportunity came to make it again, and, and uh, you know, I, there was other things that I could have done yeah, I'm sure. then, uh, but I felt like, you know, this idea of making movies as, uh, as a risk, you know, as, as something that could be very pure and something that could, that could go deep inside on and make, make a movie that, you know, came from, from, 
a, a deep subconscious place, you know, something that felt very personal to me was the way to go after after Blue Valentine. It's something that was in, impossible because there was like for every reason, the place beyond the pines was a nearly impossible film to make. You know? I heard you said like Robert McKee would not approve, but yes. screw him, <laughs> like basically, yeah, you know? yeah. But uh, one one last thing because I know you got to go, and I just wanted to ask, I had to ask, um, with Blue Valentine, it was sort of became. Uh, lore in a way, the way that you captured some of this stuff where the camera's always rolling, you know, the, some of the scenes that people uh, I think will be studying many years from now, the stuff on the bridge, the, you know, the, the little jig that takes place outside the store, um, yeah. just stuff like that. And so I wonder, with that and, and with Beyond the Pines, it, is the idea that no matter how it's actually going to appear in film, like I know movies are generally made out, shot out of order, yeah. like, but it seems like it would be very hard with the emotional journey that you did with Blue Valentine and then also with Place Beyond the Pines to do it in any way but in order. And so I'm just wondering, did how did you sort of go about it with, with both of those? You know, what, Oh, yeah, linear order. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's... yeah. I think you want to do it in chronological order, linear order, as much as you can, you know, you're, and you want to try to build your schedules in a way that makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. But also, it just doesn't always work out that way, you know, and you can't, and, and, uh, you know, I fought against it a lot on Blue Valentine, but then I could say, okay, well, then I'm not making the movie, and then I don't make the movie because of something like that. So I learned to kind of embrace it and try to do it in a way that would, was, uh, it was smart and that would help us and for instance on the place beyond the pines the first scene in the mo in, that we shot with Ryan and Ava in the place beyond the pines was the scene that takes place in the trailer so the very first scene was a scene where they had to get in this trailer completely naked uh, was just shooting their faces but they had to have that intimacy um, and uh, they had to talk about um, their child and about ice cream and it was incredibly terrifying, that experience, you know, to start the movie out with them like that. And it, uh, it, it created an immediate trust. For Ava, uh, all of us on set were like, this girl is the, the bravest actress we've ever seen, you know, to actually to walk onto a set and she was terrified, and I know because she was trembling. Mm -hmm. And to do this, and to be so brave as to do that, it was, it basically set the stage. It, it was jumping in the pool all the way, you know what right. I mean? It wasn't testing the water. It was jumping in, so once, you, once we did that, we could do everything, we knew we could do anything else, you know? Uh, and so, if you can set it up in those ways, where you, you can, you can uh, uh, it can help you, can actually help you, because otherwise, if, if I shot that scene chronologically, every other scene that came before it would be, you know, it would be this weird tension of getting right. to that right. scene, right. and right. then we'd get to that scene right. and it would have too much build-up. Right. But it was just like, okay, let's go. That get scene, out of the we way. Have, we're shooting it yeah. in, you know, now. Let's, you know, um, and so, it, that, you know, it's, it, I, I try to listen to the universe, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and try to, uh, force it into being the way that mm -hmm. is going to help them. I don't ever want to do anything to hurt the movie, but also think, okay, well, maybe this is the way it's meant to be. Just like moving the movie from, you know, Blue Valentine yeah. from Morro Bay to Scranton. I'm so thankful I did that. It was the way it was meant to be. So you have to take the, the signs, not to sound too no, it makes sense. new agey, but you have to just let go a little bit. Well, thank you and congratulations and. Uh, I, for people that are going to watch this, it just was bought, so that's yes. another. I guess 2013 we'll see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's imp it's an important one because I think like this story could just as easily have been something in the Middle East where you know somebody kills somebody else's son and it goes to the next generation. Or so it's a universal story. It's exciting for I think people yeah. could get a lot out of it. Oh, thank uh, you, thank you. Thank yes, the legacy of blood. Yeah, yeah. It's but thank you, thank you for your time.